I'd like you to welcome um, Senator Judd Gregg, Nuclear Matters, Dan Weekly, uh, we Weekly from Dominion Resources, and Bill Moll from uh, Entergy. Where do you want us to sit? You'll sit right here in the hot seat next to me. <laughs> and we'll give those guys a little bit of a break. So, um, Senator, you've had a, a, a very successful um, and diverse political career. Um, you've been involved in many, many different things. And um, you, know, you find yourself now uh, front and center in uh, steering um, nuclear matters forward. So tell the audience about nuclear matters and tell them what your, its goals are and what you're trying to go ahead and accomplish um, uh, at the helm. Well, thanks, Chris. It's great to be here with Bill and Daniel. And uh, nice to have a chance to talk with everybody. Come to Boston, visit our country cousins from just over the border, and escape the presidential candidates that are in New Hampshire today. <laughs> uh, nuclear matters uh, arose be because a lot of us are very concerned, obviously, about the future of nuclear power, and especially plants which are operating today and which may be closed before their useful life is up. Uh, myself and Evan Bai chair this group. It's made up of a lot of different constituencies who are very interested in this issue. The, you know, when somebody walks in their home and turns on their light switch, uh, they just want the lights to go on. They don't think about where the power is coming from. They don't think about anything that has to do with the technical questions of how they actually get that power. But when the light doesn't go on, then they start to think about it and they start to worry. And our concern is that if we prematurely close a, a fair number of nuclear plants before their use of life is up, we'll have people starting to go into their house and maybe turning on their light switch and the light won't come on. Uh, or alternatively, we will be doing degradation to the environment, which is unnecessary. Uh, the nuclear industry truly is an extraordinarily positive contributor to our economy, but it's also an extraordinarily positive contributor to our environment. Uh, it represents carbon-free emissions, or no carbon emissions, uh, uh, carbon-free energy. Uh, and as a result, uh, in a time when we're concerned about global warming and about the question of how we deal with the issue of, of clean air, uh, it, it is a really critical resource for us to keep online. When you look at New England, for example, 55% uh, of, and you folks all know these facts, 55% of New Hampshire's power comes from uh, nuclear. 12% uh, of Massachusetts, 48% of Connecticut. If you take that power out of the mix, then you're going to add the equivalent of millions of cars to the roads, relative to carbon emissions. Uh, and the impact on the, on the quality of life uh, could be significant. At a national level, of course, nuclear power represents 64% of the non-carbon emitting uh, energy in this country and 20% of our energy mix. And as a result, promoting this industry and making sure that people understand it and the importance that it plays in their daily lives of when they go and turn on the light switch is critical. So we pulled together this group called Nuclear Matters, and basically it is focused primarily on how we keep plants which are operating and have a useful life which is still considerable online, uh, and how we communicate to the American people and educate the American people of the importance of these plants and of nuclear power in their day-to-day -day life, not only in the quality of their life and in the environment, but also in their ability to keep their jobs, have their jobs, and have us have reasonably priced energy in this country. We unfortunately have one example here in New England, Vermont Yankee, of a plant closing prematurely. The impact of that hasn't really been felt yet, but it will be felt. The fact is that, uh, that almost all the power that that plant produced will be replaced by carbon emitting resources, uh, which is really sort of foolish when you think about it. Uh, secondly, almost all the power that that plant produced will be replaced by power that's being produced outside the region and being brought into the region. And, and thirdly, it's actually going to affect the price of power for a lot of folks. In the southeastern part of New Hampshire, southwestern part of New Hampshire, they're talking potentially a 50% price increase in energy. Uh, and that plant had a license to keep going for 
fair number of years. And so it makes no sense to close these plants prematurely. And uh, myself and Evan Bayh and the folks at Nuclear Matters are, are trying to raise the awareness in the marketplace of ideas as, the, as to the importance of nuclear power and make the issue of how you resolve these questions of how you keep the nuclear plants open a more viable area for politicians to address and get into. Great. Let me uh, move the question uh, now to, uh, to Bill Moll. Uh, with Entergy, and I'd like to start by thanking Entergy for all the help it's given me personally as a professor at NYU, in addition to being an analyst at Bloomberg, in educating uh, young people about the importance of nuclear power. And when I take those kids into the spent fuel pools, I watch their eyes, and it really, light, light bulbs go off in that. So thank you very much for Absolutely. your company's support of that. So, um, Senator mentioned Vermont Yankee, okay? You were in the front lines of the, that whole process. Uh, so give us an idea for what happened sure. uh, and um, what is the impact uh, economically, environmentally, and uh, wh where do we sit with this? So with Vermont Yankee, um, you know, I think a lot of people think it was a political decision to shut down that plant. That was far from the truth. In fact, from the legal perspective, we, were, we believe we were winning that battle. Uh, the decision was really based purely on economics. So we all know that... The U.S. is blessed with shale gas. We have low gas prices. That kind of is what it is. Uh, but contributing to the problem with Vermont Yankee was also what we have termed poor market structure, where we're really not properly valuing the attributes of generation resources. And as it relates to nuclear, that means it's carbon free, it's got on site fuel, it's a base load resource that provides stability to the system. Um, and simply put, we think that when you look at market structure, so the prices for capacity and energy have been suppressed in the markets that we're dealing with, in this case, ISO New England. Um, simply put, when you looked at the economics associated with that plant, uh, costs exceeded revenues no matter what range of outcomes we looked at. Um, and so we had to make the decision to shut down that facility. We had. Uh, over 600 employees at that, at that plant. Um, you know, we're at this point, we're down to probably less than 200 employees. Um, and so those employees either had to be redeployed, lost their jobs, um, and obviously had a huge economic impact on the local communities. Uh, we're in the process right now of renegotiating taxes, those types of things. But obviously now we've got a uh, generator that's receiving no revenue. So obviously there's not going to be the, the uh, same amount of taxes paid, the same community support, etc. So it has a huge impact on the community, but just as important is the impact to the whole region. When, uh, as the senator said, you know, that was a carbon-free resource. It was really, when you look at it compared to other alternatives, the cost to operate is cheaper because now what's happened in New England is you've seen a decline, you've seen a lot of resources come offline in addition to Vermont Yankee, or are projected to come offline in the near term. What that means is the regions come into parity in terms of reserve margin. So no longer do you have excess capacity on the system that you can leverage and get cheaper prices for. Now you're moving into new build economics, whether that's new build gas, whether that's renewable resources, whatever you decide to do. And while certainly the region has the option to determine what makes sense for, from a resource perspective, what resource mix it uh, wants to achieve in the long run, you know, what's really lacking is any type of long-term plan. So, you know, if, you, if you're running a power system, you should have three long-term objectives. Reliability, economic sustainability, for customers, but also for the generators, and you should have an objective for environmental sustainability. In these markets, they don't have those long-term objectives. They're simply operating in a short-term market based on state policies, based on the economics of a short-term auction, and I can assure you there will be unintended consequences, as the Senator points out. A few months before uh, Entergy closed down Vermont Yankee, um, uh, Dominion went through the same situation in Kiwanee, uh in Wisconsin. Um, 
How are they similar? How are they different? Well, thanks again for the opportunity to be here, and it's really glad to be back in Boston. I actually spent 10 years of my career, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be back in, in the Boston area. Um, it's almost a carbon copy of what happened in, in Vermont. And just for everyone's knowledge, you know, uh, we're referring to the Kewanee Nuclear Station. It's located in Kewanee County, town of Carleton in Wisconsin. It's a facility that we purchased back in the 2005-2006 time frame. Single unit, about 600 megawatts there. Same staffing as Vermont Yankee, had about 600 employees there. And when we purchased the plant, it came with a power purchase agreement that with basically the home utilities were, sell were buying the power from us at a fixed price. And, you know, as we work through and all the investment back into that plant, we, you know, we put more than $200 million of improvements back into that station. Station was running great. Capacity factors are what you would expect. I would tell you it was operating at peak efficiency at that time. But then as other resources came online, they, they basically made the decision, those utilities, that they did not want to to pay for the power at that point. They wanted to, what I'll call, float it into the market. They, they wanted, wanted it free? Well, you know, I'll tell you, it's, it's, a, it's a big issue long term for the single unit generators out there, single unit sites out there, because, you know, we, we operate under the standpoint is we get paid as we run, un, unlike other facilities. And the nuclear fleet with the capacity factor is running more than 90 percent of the time. I would argue that we are the foundation of the whole generation fleet across the country in the sense that when you look to the nuclear units, nuclear units are running at efficiency never, ever seen before. So I think the, the, the industry is doing a fabulous job when it comes to that. But back to your point specifically, with when, when you have to guarantee your revenues cover your cost, we had to make that hard decision. And we actually put that station up for sale and tried to sell it for more than a year. And, you know, people saw those long-term power prices that, you know, that Bill referenced out there, and we had to make that hard decision, which is, it's a hard decision to, to look the employees in the eye and say, you've been doing a great job, but it's also a hard decision to, to have that communities out there that are so supportive. This is the biggest taxpayer, you know, in that region, of course. Um, they actually did their own economic impact, and I've seen many of these studies, but the one multiplier that always gets to me is for every job inside the plant, they use the multiplier as there's three quarters of a job outside the plant. So they came back and, and indicated that the economic impact of that region was about $500 million a year from support services. You know, talking, you know, thinking about the comment that the senator made, which he's absolutely right, the environmental impact is huge, but the day-to-day -day impact of, of the localities. Um, we are in the same position trying to negotiate a property tax settlement with that community out there, and, you know, it's a tough discussion to have with them right now. Senator, so if, I, go ahead. If, I could, if I could just... Both, uh, Chris, if I could just lead into something that both Bill and Dan have said and, and put it in the pol politics of the term terminology. Uh, what we're confronting today is the fact that there are a number of plants in this country, about approximately 20 plants and tw at 10 facilities, which are the price of their powers being that they're being paid for is not reflecting the contribution that mm -hmm. that power makes first, the economy of the country, and second, to the environment, protection of the environment. Uh, it doesn't ref there's no credit for carbon-free emission, mm -hmm. uh, and yet these are the plants that are pr producing most of the carbon-free emission power in the country, as I said, 63% of it. There's no credit for reliability. When we went through the polar vortex of two years ago, and we may get it again, who knows, or maybe a, a heat vortex this year, uh, it was nuclear that kept running, over 90% operational, 24-7, uh, uh, and it picked up the slack where other types of energy were confronted with the weather and were not able to function at that type of reliability. And it's not credited for diversity. Uh, we would be foolish as a nation to take offline plants that are vibrant, operating, producing power, uh, on the anticipation that we're going to get the energy from some other source and end up with all our eggs in one basket. And all eggs in one basket energy policy is inherently foolish. Uh, and so these factors are not being considered. We're, you know, nuclear is being priced at a spot price uh, when it is a long-term capital investment which needs to have adequate return on that investment uh, and reflect the fact that it contributes in these unique ways to our energy mix, to our economy, and to our environment. 
Uh, and that's the message we're trying to deliver here at Nuclear Matters, that trying to educate people to that fact. So, so that when politicians make these decisions, which they're going to have to make, because mm -hmm. we do need an energy mm -hmm. policy, yes. uh, they don't make them, they make them with an awareness of these issues. We'll come back to the topic of portfolio diversity and also to the topic of regional diversity, uh, hopefully in, in a few minutes. But before we do, um, I had the opportunity to visit the Pilgrim plant yesterday. And after visiting the Pilgrim plant, I said, well, there's a beautiful beach nearby that I'm going to go for a stroll. And I was strolling around in my disco boots and my you know, tie and jacket. And people <laughs> were looking at me kind of strangely. And I started asking questions. And there was one couple, retired, um, who were um, on the beach enjoying the day. And uh, I asked some questions about the power plant. And they said, yeah, it's there. It's been there for a long time. It's a very, very small part of the community uh, as far as physical space. It generates a tremendous amount of uh, power. And he said two things that struck with me. He says, my father worked on building the plant. And secondly, he says, is that if they ever close that plant, my taxes go up 20%. So is the Pilgrim plant uh, similarly threatened uh, in energy's eyes regarding this, what's happening in, in the New England region. Um, uh, what's different between the Pilgrim plant and Vermont Yankee and Kewanee? The Pilgrim plant obviously is, is a single unit uh, site and uh, it's probably in a better geographic location in terms of ability to serve load and so you would think that that would be you know, compensated for in terms of what the over, overall market structure. But our position on Pilgrim is, you know, we haven't made any decision that we plan to shut it down. But I can tell you that if we don't see some policy changes in terms of how the markets are structured, and one thing people need to understand is when we think, talk about markets, you know, you hear a lot about what's happening in capacity markets. I, Think, it, when you think of compensation for a nuclear plant, about 15 to 20 percent of the revenue stream comes from capacity, and about 85, 80 to 85 percent comes from energy, because they run, as Dan mentioned, at such a high capacity factor. So, Pilgrim is at risk as a single unit site. We have been working very hard with the entire industry. In fact, recently between NEI, EEI, uh, EPSA, the Electric, Electric Power Supply Association, and the Gas Association, we've approached both FERC, Secretary Moniz, and others in D.C. about some changes that we believe are appropriate from an energy price formation perspective. Uh, and we've actually put forth some principles in that we really want FERC to use to direct the ISOs to change market structure so that these units have the ability to be competitive in these markets and survive. And so, you know, we're working very hard on that. So my, the message is something's got to change. You talk about Illinois and what Exelon's facing and what they've proposed uh, as it relates to more of a clean energy standard or price on carbon. You look in New York, you've got units like Gene, which under, are under distress. We've talked about Vermont Yankee. We've got plants at Pilgrim. We've got plants at Fitzpatrick, single unit sites. We need to see some changes in policy or we're going to be dealing with more decisions like Vermont Yankee in the, in the future. Is it fair to say that um, the closure of Kiwani and the closure of uh, Vermont Yankee, the power that was now gone, is replaced by natural gas? Generally, I think that's the case. You may, I mean, there's obviously some renewables coming in, but you know, when you look at the energy output of a baseload nuclear plant, most of it's going to be a fossil fuel, and most of that will be natural gas. So is it fair to extend the corollary that you close a nuclear power plant, it's replaced by natural gas, CO2 emissions go up? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, In fact, uh, CO2 emissions went up by 1.3 billion pounds just in a two-month period right after Vermont Yankee was closed. I know I start coughing a lot. <laughs> uh, I've read somewhere uh, that um, closing the Millstone plants um, in Connecticut, 2,000 uh, megawatts, 
would be disastrous for the stability uh, uh, of the grid um, and um, adverse consequences, obviously, for CO2 emissions. What is the, um, the, the challenges that, does Millstone face similar challenges or it's a much larger plant? Uh, tell us about that. Okay, uh, well, and I wanna back up half a step if I could and say I'm so pleased to hear the Senator talk about national energy policy and whatnot. We wish, glad to have you here today, but we wish you were still in Washington basically saying the exact same thing. In the I sense like that. that. I'll tell you what, it was, um, <laughs> I just don't believe, I've been doing government affairs for a long time, I don't believe you can separate energy policy and environmental policy anymore. I think they need to be one and the same. And, and I desperately agree that the national energy policy is, a, is an area that's lacking. Not a criticism of anyone out there, but that's something that's got to be, for our nation's security, that has got to be a front and center issue. Um, the Millstone facility is in a little bit of a different situation. Those of you not familiar with Millstone, uh, Millstone is, in essence, when it was built, is three totally separate designs, three totally separate facilities there, and it was, it was built that way by intention, by the way. So the first unit was permanently retired in 1997, which was about a 600 megawatt boiling water reactor, then units two and units three. Uh, different de designs, different vendors. So in essence, the way to think about that is it's really two separate and distinct plants under one roof. So it's never gonna be the lowest cost provider in the country. You don't get much economies of scale there. So you don't have operators that can work on both units. So all the training is doubled up, maintenance parts, all that. Um, the challenge that Millstone has had, in essence, has been tax challenges over the, a few years ago when you know, uh, Connecticut candidly was in a state of uh, budget challenges and they came along with a, a generation tax. It's the for, for only tax I'm ever aware of where they came along and said, you know, we love you, you're running great, you help keep the lights on, but we need more money. So they, they came along with a tax that was pointed directly at us. Now, that tax went away um, as the, the governor and, and legislature indicated later, but I think a lot of people were concerned that says, wait a minute, if you're looking at recruiting businesses and stability in a, route, in a region that already has high energy costs, how do you factor in a tax which is going to increase taxes more? I mean, that, that single tax was more than $40 million a year that went into the, the state budget in Connecticut. And so, you know, when you recruit businesses, one of the things you always talk about is workforce, reliability of energy, and that's, that's, a, that's hard math to get to about how that could be a, an economic development tool. Um, I would also say that, I'm, I'm back to the same point, and, and Bill referenced it here. When you talk about what the communities think about these, these power stations and whatnot, Millstone has our neighbors right up against the fence line in the sense that it's a beautiful part of the, the country, beautiful part of Connecticut. Um, I think that we get along great with our neighbors. They, they're comfortable with it. Um, we always said that um, um, we don't, uh, you shouldn't call us if you're concerned about security and reliability of the plant. We owe that to you. That is something to safe operation of the plant, of these plants. And it's the whole industry. It's not just Dominion. That's a responsibility that, that we have to you there, straight up. So we're, we're happy to answer any questions. I, I got a kick out of John's comment about come to Idaho and look at our facility. Come to Millstone, we love doing tours. I mean, I'll tell you, that's, I, am, I truly believe that is one of the best tools that we have to let folks come in and see how the plants operate from a security standpoint and from an operation standpoint. We love having people come in. One of the complaints that I have when I go take students to, um, to uh, Entergy's facilities because they're close to New York is, you know, I should have come here when I was a high school student because I may have gone on a different educational track, mm -hmm. got the engineering degree and got into this industry. Senator, what are your thoughts on all of that? Well, I, I think it's unfortunate that in the post 9-11 world, the reality is that the openness of the plants can't be the way they were. I mean, I, Seabrook, which I live right next door to, can actually see it. Uh, uh, is used to have wonderful access. Now it still has access, but it's not the way it used to be, and it can't be mm -hmm. because of the mm -hmm. sign of the times. But whatever we can do to raise the public's awareness and knowledge of how safe these plants are, uh, and how and what good jobs they are for people, uh, is very important. Well, it's one of the key things that really Nuclear Matters is helping us with, in terms of really getting the message out there. 
uh, you know, the best ambassadors we have are the people who run those facilities mm -hmm. because they live close to those plants. They know what happens within those facilities. They know how stringent we are. They know that the standards are very high. And so they do a great job. And we've got to do a better job getting them out in the communities and even broader to explain to others just how safe these facilities are. I think the one thing that always struck me, and I spent 10 years at Millstone, and, and I've been in the power business my whole career, but I don't know another, uh, anyone else in the energy business that goes through what the nuclear folks do, on, whether it's the NRC and the Atomic Safety Licensing Board prior to them, about going through the what if scenarios. What if this part fails right here? Or what if this component doesn't respond to the signal? And there is always a process for that. There is always what I will call a fail safe. They have thought that through, through the smallest component. What if this happens? And it, it's, it's amazing industry to watch, be a part of. We talked about um, portfolio diversity from a utility perspective. Um, I'd also like to probe a little bit about portfolio diversity from a regional perspective. And so, um, you know, are we in a good balance now that we're going to disrupt, or how, what's the optimal balance for the New England region as far as incorporating nuclear? And if we start closing down more plants in, in the region, we're, are, are we headed for trouble, Senator? Well, the way I always looked at it when I was governor and when I was, was representing the state was that we don't have the natural resources of some of the other parts of our country. We're not Texas. We're not Western Pennsylvania even. We don't have fracking. We don't have oil. Don't have really a viable wind industry that's going to be major. I mean, unless we want to put it on top of the White Mountains, which would probably affect our tourism industry. So I'm not sure the trade-off would be all that great. Sun shines up here, but some days it doesn't. <laughs> so really, our, if we want a home-based energy source, uh, you can get some hydro, but really it's nuclear. I've always looked at it that way. And New Hampshire now, 55% of our energy comes from nuclear. Seabrook uh, exports nuclear. Uh, it would be nice if our transmission lines were better so we could export a lot more. But the simple fact is that these plants represent our oil reserves as states. I mean, we don't have the oil reserves that West Texas has, but we've got a nuclear plant that produces energy, and uh, we need them. We need them if we're going to be competitive in the rest of the country with being able to produce energy for industries which want to, might want to come here. I'll go back to my <clears throat> point on having a long-term plan. You know, I think every region's different, and uh, as the Senator suggests, there's maybe limited, some limited options up here. But the folks in the New England area need to demand that there is a plan, on a long-term plan on how to have a sustainable power supply system, okay? And I don't see that. Uh, diversity is absolutely critical. And you, know, you can see that there is no plan because you see what we're dealing with even when they want to put gas plants in. Well, they don't even have the pipeline infrastructure to supply the fuel to the gas plants. And so you're taking and looking at a very short-term window in terms of you know, what the market is versus long-term risk. And you need a diverse portfolio to manage that risk, just like you do your investment portfolio. And so I, I think what's happening is you're seeing the states impose their own policies, which that's fine, but they don't understand the unintended consequences of those on the front end of the curve, and there's no long-term plan on how to achieve objectives for reliability, economic sustainability, and environmental sustainability. I really think that's what has to happen in these markets. Utilities used to do that, and it was decided to create these competitive markets. Okay, that worked when there was excess capacity. We're now to the point there's no excess capacity. You don't have the luxury of being wrong. So you need a plan that makes some sense. I, I couldn't agree more. I actually boil it down to the simple question. Do you want to control your own destiny or do you want someone else to control the destiny for you? In the sense that natural gas is a great fuel and, you know, Dominion's a company that's, do, you know, building a number of large pipelines, you know, natural gas generation stations, which are fabulous, by the way. Heat rate on those units is, is you know, the efficiency is basically off the chart now. but. New England is different in the sense that, you know, when I started in this market back in the early 2000s timeframe, 
you know, we were at a less than 10% uh, generation, gas generation capacity. We are now more than 50% here. And we don't have immediate access to the fuel, whether it's coming in from the Marcellus and Utica shales out of the Appalachian regions of the country, or even coming in from Canada. The reality is we are at the end of the pipeline network, whichever the gas comes from, whichever direction. Nuclear is one where we can control our own destiny in the sense that it is self-sufficient. We are right there. We are the point of source for that, for that electricity. We don't depend on anybody else. So not saying that, that we're going to be in a, in a challenge situation, because I know the folks from the ISO are here, but it's kind of back to that scenario I talked about nuclear a few minutes ago. What if? What if other things happen down the pipeline that others are dealing with? Nuclear, we're controlling our own destiny right there. <laughs> The analysis uh, of the uh, uh, energy markets that um, in, in the situation where you have a polar vortex, which the Senator mentioned a few minutes ago, um, with, if the polar vortex had occurred as it had um, when Vermont Yankee was not operating, what were the consequences for the people of Vermont and New Hampshire being at the end of the pipe uh, as far as reliability in very, very cold weather? to perhaps not have heat or perhaps not have electricity. Has there been any um, uh, discussion about that and trying to plan for avoiding the inevitable next polar vortex in the absence of, uh, of a nuclear power plant to serve the needs of the people in Vermont and New Hampshire? Well, it's funny because from a business perspective, you know, the polar vortex uh, created an opportunity in the market to actually uh, generate some revenue, right? which you would say is a, is a positive thing. But really, when you think about it, it went to such extremes because of all the constraints across the system. Um, and you saw what the impacts were to the consumer. And you saw where you know, people's bills went up 30, 40 percent. That's not good okay, <clears throat> in general. You, that type of price volatility that goes through to consumers is not good. Again, uh, Without Vermont Yankee, you, you're less, another 600 megawatts of a, of a unit that's got on-site fuel uh, that provides reliability, base load resources, that's now gone. So that has to be replaced largely with more gas. Now this winter we didn't have the same weather and they've taken some steps to do some things with fuel, with LNG, et cetera, which mitigated some of the price increases. But again, there, they're not thinking long term. And what you would want to do in, you know, in a system is make sure that you've got stable prices that may fluctuate within a range, but you, it's not good for any of us in this industry, whether it's the generators, whether it's the consumers, to see significant price spikes that put a burden on other businesses, residential customers, et cetera. And so again, why a diverse portfolio is absolutely critical. You know, Bill has mentioned now a couple of times, and absolutely correctly, as Dan reiterated, that we don't have a national policy. We don't even have a good regional policy. Uh, and I think that's why Evan and I are so enthusiastic about nuclear matters, because as people who've been involved in political life, Evan was a governor and, and a senator, also, we understand that you really can't do national policy or, or regional policy on issues like this unless you've got popular understanding. And so this is one of the reasons we're so aggressively promoting uh, nuclear matters, to try to get public awareness up on the critical issues which we've just Absolutely. been discussing. Because you really can't get public policy people to make these tough decisions unless the public says, okay, we do need decisions in this area. <clears throat> uh, when uh, Vermont Yankee was um, uh, closed, capacity payments were at very, very low levels. Um, so f can we um, investigate or explore a little bit the importance of those capacity payments? Are they still at very, very low levels throughout the region? Or is, and, and is that something that's easy to go ahead and change and balance? Or, Well, uh, you know, I think uh, the ISO has done a nice job of addressing some of the issues associated with capacity. And so, you know, I think prior to uh, Vermont Yankee, we were seeing capacity prices in the three, four dollars a KW month. Uh, they've gone up closer to nine or ten dollars a KW month and that's starting to attract some new build generation. Um, so yeah and they put up a, a performance incentive program in place which you know we support 
uh, generally support. Uh, so, but you know, I, I don't know if you've been following it, but when those prices went up, there was a huge reaction by the politicians that said, oh my gosh, why do people have to pay more now for this, why are this price gone up three times? Well, it's because you lost about three, you're losing about 3,000 megawatts of capacity out of the system uh, because they're no longer economically viable. And so it, it's really tough because uh, the politicians have to deal with their constituents, which see, and they see this price increase, but you really have to have that price increase in the market in order to attract new generation. And, you know, again, as the senator mentioned, it's really an education process. People haven't had to deal with this in competitive markets in general because there's been excess capacity and the price has been going down. Now we're no longer in that situation. We're at parity or we're going below targeted reserve margins. We have to build new generation. Investors need some assurances that they're going to be paid fairly for that generation. And that is the bottom line problem with these markets, is investors are very uh, uncertain about their willingness to continue to deploy capital. And sooner or later, that's going to affect your long-term objectives of reliability, economic sustainability, and environmental sustainability. I, I agree. I think capacity markets are trending in the right direction. Do I think we're being compensated for the, the foundational support that I talked about before? No, I candidly don't. Um, but that signal that Bill's referencing is when I was coming back up, came by the, the Fall River plant, Brayton Point. And I think those of you who know, Brayton Point is a 1,200 megawatt coal unit just about an hour south of here. Yeah. It was not running. It's the end of June and it's been hot. You know, if the price signals were out there, I know we're here to talk about nuclear, but we're also talking here to talk about diversity at the same time. If the market was sending the price, price, proper price signals, how is it a 1,200 megawatt baseload coal unit was not running? So obviously that, that shows that there's a challenge. Any further thoughts before I open up the floor to uh, questions? No, I, I think we should turn to questions. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I can't see anything because of the bright lights, but, uh, oh, John, uh, uh, please go ahead, uh, identify yourself to the rest of the audience uh, and um, fire away with uh, your question. Hi there, I'm John Kutch, uh, Terrestrial Energy, and I just, I've been uh, harping on this for, for ages and I'd love to get your guys' opinion. Every month that I get my electric bill, there's a, uh, there's a little tick box that says, oh, do you want to just buy all uh, renewable, quote unquote, energy? And, and I always write, I demand to have a checkbox that I want to buy 100% nuclear energy. <laughs> and I'm from Illinois, the most nuclear state in the nation. You know, we get 55% of our power from nuclear. Chicago gets over 70. We're the France of the United States. <laughs> and, uh, and I know ComEd and Nuclear Matters have been working very hard. Why don't they demand to put that, uh, or just generally, what do you think of uh, putting that? Because that would show people when their electric bills actually went down quite a bit if they got pure nuclear power, instead of, you know, when you, when you opt in for renewable power, you're saying, I'm willing to double my electric bill. Right. Well, if you opted in for pure nuclear power, you're saying, hey, I want to reduce my electric bill by quite a substantial amount. Well, amen. I mean, I mean, it's it's a. Uh, I actually have never, you know, heard the question about I, I want all nuclear. But I, I would tell you, most people. I shouldn't say most. Lots of people recognize the, the importance that that nuclear bring. You know, uh, at my time at Millstone and Kevin Hennessy, who's responsible for that unit, is here today. You know, we did a poll down in Connecticut a number of years ago, and it, it kind of just started out of wouldn't it be great if that we were to ever expand the, the, the millstone unit. And, and that was not something that was really in our long-term plan. It just kind of became some chatter more than anything else. And I will tell you, the people in, you know, who participated in the, in the poll overwhelmingly supported expansion of that facility for exactly what you just talked about, impact, positive impact to the environment, stability of long-term pricing. There was very, very good support about that. And if I could expand your, your question just a little bit with your permission, um, as we work through, as EPA works through the Clean Power Plan, you know, we refer to it as 111D, you know, which is 
reducing carbon dioxide emissions across the country from the, from the utilities fleet. I, I continue to believe that if we are truly serious about reducing carbon dioxide, new nuclear and expanded nuclear is the key component of that because that is just the, made, that's the driving force. So I continue to think that will be the game changer. I think it's interesting we found in, after starting this initiative that uh, there was obviously in the 60s and 70s, maybe even into the 80s, in the environmental movement, a, a, a fairly virulent anti-nuclear element. Uh, that's abated. And in fact, uh, Carol Browner is a major player in our undertaking. And she's very forthright. She said she's, you know, she used to be very an antagonistic towards nuclear power. And now she's come to the conclusion, which she says is simply undeniable, that if you're concerned about the environment, which the folks who are checking the renewables obviously are, then you've got to be for nuclear because you can't get to the carbon reduction requirements under 11, 111D or, or under Kyoto or under anything else unless you've got nuclear in your mix. It's 64, 63% of what is the non-emitting uh, energy for carbon, non-emitting carbon. So uh, I think we've got, I think we're making progress in that form at least of educating folks who are very interested in the environment as a and their concerns about it, that nuclear ha has to be a major part of the mix if you're going to be successful, just as Daniel said. So many questions. Uh, this gentleman over here, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Rod, you already had your chance. This is over here, this, yes, please. You, please identify yourself and uh, um, uh, let us know who. Yeah, uh, Jim Black, I'm a retired engineer. But uh, Senator, I uh, just, I understand about Carol Browner, but the NRDC, the EDF, the big guys are still very, very, very soft on environment, on the nuclear. And the reason is, is because they get all their money from celebrities and movie stars and people like that. And those people have really still got Chernobyl and Three Mile Island and Fukushima in their minds. And, uh, so they go down the road of solar and uh, wind. And uh, I've written to them. I've tried to explain you're really way out of date on nuclear. And uh, all they do is write back and say, thank you for your contribution. <laughs> well, you know, I think, I, you're, I think the term that is important in what you just said is they're soft. They used to be hard over. And I do think that our efforts are, are moving the needle. And the fact that really, nationally recognized, thoughtful people like Carol Browner understand this and are making the case too among, in, within the environmental community is very positive. And it's obvious. I mean, to me, coming from New Hampshire where we put a great reliance on what we call common sense, I recognize that's not high here in Boston. Um, that's New Hampshire <laughs> thought. Um, <laughs> is, it, it, is that you know, common sense tells you you can't get there from here. You know, there's an old New Hampshire joke. Somebody pulls over and asks this guy how, he get, how you get to Epping, New Hampshire, and he suggests four different ways and disagrees with all of them and finally says, well, you can't get there from here. Well, the simple fact is you can't get there from here if you want to reduce carbon without nuclear. Mm -hmm. uh, wind and solar aren't going to make it because they simply can't absorb the, the levels of energy production that are required. So, and I think that's what a common sense is starting to feed into the system, and the safety record of nuclear is so extraordinarily high. Uh, and especially American nuclear industry is incredibly high. And the, they've, the action's been taken to correct issues which might have occurred in Japan. Uh, so. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, these gentlemen will be available for your questions later on. I wish we could spend more time to answer them. But I want to ask the Senator one last question here, uh, a brief one. Where's nuclear matters going to be a year or two from now? Well, hopefully we'll be out of business because we will have made the case and the American people will have signed on to it. Uh, but the goal, quite honestly, is to raise the public perception high enough as the importance of specifically, we're, we've got a fairly targeted agenda here, specifically of the plants that are at risk, that the public policy people in those communities, states, and at the federal level who are going to have an impact on whether those plants continue to run understand the issue well enough to make good decisions. Make good decisions to reward reliability, lack of carbon emissions, uh, diversity, 
uh, correct the transmission line issues so that these plants continue to run. Uh, that, we've, got a, we've got a pretty definable goal here. It's sort of like a bottom line for, for these companies. Our goal is keep these plants online because it'd be foolish to take them offline. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.